Welcome to the Lighthouse Baptist Church Sermon Archive. Today, you'll be listening to a message from the Word of God. Though preaching is no substitute for your personal walk with the Lord Jesus Christ, it does have the potential to convict and edify the believer. Please listen and be open to this message preached from the pulpit of Lighthouse Baptist Church. A great God, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3 is where we'll be this morning. We're continuing our series through the pastoral epistles and we're calling it the letters to the leaders. And we've learned already in our, our series here that every Christian is called to be a leader. And these books of the Bible are talking to the leaders of the leaders. So we're walking our way through the highlights of these small but very impactful books of the Bible. And this morning, we're going to start in first, or excuse me, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. This is the Apostle Paul talking and writing to Timothy. And he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. God, I pray that you will bless the reading of your word today, and I pray that you will move in our midst. I pray this will be a time where you speak to hearts and that a response will be something that we're expecting and willing to do. And we'll ask all of these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. It's ironic that New Year's resolutions are often associated with quitting. Not being able to follow through, it's sad, but, it, but that's the case. When you think of a New Year's resolution, the word continue may not be the first word you think of. In fact, how many of you have made a New Year's resolution and before January 1st, you already convinced yourself this is not happening? Okay. Like, I'm, I'm, I am a fool for even telling myself this. This is not happening. By the way, uh, we're halfway through the year. So how's it going? How's it going? Uh, How's how's the resolution working out for you on July 16th? Hmm. At this point, you may have even forgotten you made a New Year's resolution. Maybe you don't want to remember that you made a New Year's resolution. You know, these verses of the Bible have a theme. And the theme of these verses of the Bible are, one word, it is continue continue. And so we've seen that every Christian is a leader. Last week, we saw that every Christian and every leader should be a theologian. Every Christian is called to know the Word of God for themselves. Every Christian is is called to meditate on Scripture. It's not just the preacher's job. It's every Christian's job to know the Word of God. We're working our way through some of the highlights of what are known as the pastoral epistles. And I want you to mark a word in verse 14, and it is simply the title of our message today. And in verse 14, the word is continue. Continue. These are letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to his co-laborers in ministry. These were letters to men that Paul was mentoring at the time. And now these men were leaders in the churches and probably even leaders over other leaders and over several churches. These are the letters to the leaders. This being our third message in this series, we've already seen that Every Christian is called to lead. You're not exempt from that. You're not exempt from that responsibility. No matter what you think uh, about this or no matter uh, what you may think you're choosing and you have a choice, you are leading 
someone, no one's exempt, somehow, some way, you're leading. You are teaching someone something. Last week, we looked at the fact that every Christian is not only called to lead, but is called to be a theologian. Every believer has the responsibility to know God's Word. No Christian is exempt. Praise the Lord, we have the very words of God at our disposal. I don't know if you've ever stepped back and just thought about that for a second, that there are parts of this world that don't have one word. Not one word. But yet we have the inspired, complete word of God at our disposal. How many of you have more than one copy? Absolutely. How many of you have a device on your person right now that you could pull out and pull up God's word on that device? Absolutely. We have it at our disposal, yet so many Christians are wandering in this life with no direction, no purpose, because they don't take advantage of the awesome privilege that we have in having God's Word, hearing from God whenever we want. This week, we're going to see that every Christian's responsibility is to continue. Praise the Lord. We have the words of the Apostle Paul here, inspired by the Holy Spirit. But it's time we step back a minute here and say, and say, How do we continue? How many of you have ever heard a preacher say something and never explained how to do it? Right? The Bible tells us that it's our job to continue, but how do we do that? How do we continue? And not only continue in our faith, but how do we ensure that faith continues beyond us? None of us are going to be here forever. We're going to pass on from this earth one of these days, and I know no one likes to think about that, but the fact remains we must, as a church, we must have a plan in place so that the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ don't just continue with us, but that they continue beyond us. So how do we continue? How do we keep going? The Bible has quite a bit to say about endurance. In Matthew chapter 24, and verse 12, it says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 4, So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 24, Let that therefore Abide in you which ye have heard from the beginning, and that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you. Ye shall also continue in the Son and in the Father. The Bible has a lot to say about continuing, a lot to say about keep going. When I was in high school, I, ran, I was in a small Christian school, and believe it or not, uh, we had a track team. And I was on the track team. Some of the students that I teach at the academy are now laughing and saying, yeah, right, it's true. I, I used to run. Used to play basketball. Used to, used to, used to. Every time I try that stuff around here now, I usually end up in the emergency room. And so we stop that. But I remember when I ran track that when we were running It was so, so much more important how you finished than how you started. So the Apostle Paul is simply telling Timothy here, continue, keep going. I want you to notice the big idea of these two verses in 2 Timothy 3. Notice that Paul is telling Timothy that he is now to continue because people before him continued. This admonishment to continue is meant to be a never-ending cycle of continuing. Now, I, I get it. This might already sound exhausting to you. You might be thinking, here's another expectation of performance or activity that's being placed on us. And listen, I get that you might be thinking that because more often than not, church culture is performance is a performance-based culture than it is a relationship-based culture. I get it. 
So you may be carrying some baggage around about this idea this morning. But we teach that in order to do something for the Lord, you must first have a relationship with the Lord. And you sh- your relationship with the Lord should be all it can be. The more enjoyable your involvement in ministry will be if your relationship is right with the Lord. So that's why I'm preaching this series of messages because every single one of them builds on the other. We must all realize that we do, in fact, have a responsibility to lead. We must all realize that since we are all called to lead in some capacity, we all must have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We also must realize that it is our responsibility to hear from God in His Word. And I'm fully aware that there are probably people that are just starting to wrap their heads and hearts around the fact that God has called them to be a leader. Say, Pastor Shope, you're on step three, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around step one. I get it. I'm I'm fully aware that it's possible that there are people in this room today that are trying to make God a bigger part of their life. I get that. So please don't expect for a minute that I'm expecting anyone to have it all together up to this point because I don't have it all together up to this point. I fail every day of my life. As far as I'm concerned, the chiefest of sinners is up here talking to you today. So I understand, thank you for that, amen. So I understand that we are all on the journey of Christian leadership together. I get it. We're on this road together. So this is not about getting you to do more stuff or to put what is perceived to be an unrealistic expectation on you. That's not what this is about. This is about knowing the route. This is about knowing how to get there. I use navigation in our vehicles even when I don't have to. Often I will even use navigation when we're traveling in downtown Winchester, when I know how to get where we're going. I won't name any names this morning, but it actually annoys a certain person that sits in the passenger seat with me when we travel. And this person, again, not naming any names, will say and ask the same question, don't you know where you're going? And I always give the same answer, yes, but I want to know when we're going to get there. I want to know when we're going to get there. So I want us to consider these these letters to the leaders, this series, I want us to consider this a GPS telling us the route that we need to take to become the leaders that God has intended us to be. But in order to get to the destination, you have to continue. And so many people get fixated on the destination that they forget to enjoy the journey. God has something for you on the way to what he has for you. A.W. Tozer said, God's plan will continue on God's schedule. So the Apostle Paul gives Timothy some Holy Spirit-inspired advice about continuing. So I want to look at Paul's advice today. And I hope that it will help you because it's helped me. The first thing Paul says is this, continue in what you've learned. Continue in what you have learned. According to this, Timothy had been brought up in a God-honoring environment. Now, this is going to differ for everyone. How, How many of you would say that you've been attending a Bible preaching church for as long as you can possibly remember? Can you raise your hand? Okay, wonderful. You can put your hands down. Um, How many of you would say that you didn't start attending a Bible-believing church until later in life? Raise your hand. Hmm, Very interesting. So you see the, 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 the mixture of people we have in this room today. This is where we see God's grace being sufficient. 
Maybe you've grown up in the Christian faith. Maybe you know all the lingo. Maybe you know how to do church. Maybe this is just second nature to you. If that's you, I want to give you a couple pieces of advice. Don't take this for granted. Don't get comfortable. It's easy to become complacent. It's it's easy to coast. It's easy to just hold on to get your get out of hell free card and hold on till Jesus comes. Don't do that. Don't do that. Paul is telling Timothy to continue in the things that he has learned. Look at the first part of verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures. This is the life that Timothy had known for as long as he could remember. Paul said, listen, you've learned so much. Now continue. You, you, you've, you've been given so much. Now continue. Keep moving forward. Keep winning the battles. Keep overcoming. Keep seeing Jesus come through. He didn't want to just do that in the early years of, of his faith. He wanted Timothy to continue now. He wants you to continue tomorrow. He wants you to continue the next day. So Christian, Paul's advice to you is continue. How about those of you who found Christ later in life or have even found Christ recently? You may be tempted to feel like that you're at a disadvantage. You may feel like you don't know as much or that you're somehow behind. Paul's advice is the same for both groups of people. Continue. Start where you are and keep going. Continue in his word. Continue in prayer. Continue in faith. God will show you great and mighty things that will increase your faith and take you to the next victory and take you to the next victory and take you to the next victory. And he wants that for all of us. The message to the church is keep going, continue. Then I want you to notice the second part of Paul's advice to Timothy. Paul Paul says to Timothy, not only continue in what you've learned, but continue in what you've been assured of. Look at verse 14 again. Paul says, continue in the things that thou hast learned, but Paul doesn't stop there. And I'm so glad Paul puts this part in here. He says, continue in the things that thou hast been assured of. There's so much more to continuing than just knowledge. Knowledge does not equate assuredness. If you're someone who has grown up in the church, you can probably bring someone to your mind that had a knowledge of the truth but did not act on that knowledge that they had. You can probably think of someone who maybe even looked like they had it all together, but in reality, they were posers who thought they had everybody fooled. There's a difference between knowing something and being assured of something. Are you assured of the truth of God's word, or is it just something that you have some knowledge about? You know about it, but it hasn't made its way into the conviction of your heart. By the way, this is why so many young people quit church. It's why so many young people leave the church after graduation because in their mind, church was something that you went to, not something that you were. The church was a building on a campus you went to one to three times a week and did the church thing, and then the rest of the week, you did whatever you wanted. Timothy had a choice just like every single one of us. Timothy had a choice to continue or he had a choice to bail out. Timothy had a choice to continue or quit. Timothy had a choice to go beyond knowledge and to be assured that the things he had learned were true. Scripture leads people to acknowledging the truth. Think of it this way. Just like uh, one lie will probably lead to another lie. Well, truth will lead to truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 25, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4, who will have all men to be saved and to come under the knowledge of the truth. 
God's desire is for you to have knowledge of the truth. Yes, but it goes beyond that. He wants you to be assured of that knowledge. He wants you to be assured of that truth. So how can you become assured of the things that you've learned? How do we do that? Well, Paul continues in verse 14. Look at, look at what he says. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. We know from other portions of Scripture that Timothy had people in his life that taught him the truth. Those people had an impact on him being assured of that truth truth. He saw the difference that the truth made in the people that taught him. We also know from other portions of scripture that at least three people had a huge impact on Timothy's life. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Timothy became sure of the truth through the influence of his family. I make no apology that my first and most important ministry is not to this church. I make no mistake in letting people know that my first and most important ministry is not to this church. There's one. I make, mo I make no mistake that my first and most important ministry is not to this church. It is to my family. My family. Hey, hey, guess what? That's, that's not just true for me. That's true for you. That's true for you. Remember, the, the church is Christ's bride, not mine. You're God's kids, not my kids. I pray every day for the Lord to help me lead my kids to know his truth. Hey, dads, your first leadership assignment is your home. You may consider yourself the leader at your workplace, but are you the leader you need to be in your home? Your coworkers may respect you, but do your kids respect you? Your career may change someday, but your kids will always be your kids. Are they assured of the faith of Jesus Christ by looking and watching you? Are they assured that God is real by watching you? Are they assured that faith, that the faith life is a life worth living by watching you? Dad, maybe it's time that we start uh, being a little bit more concerned that our kids are assured of the things of God. Moms, Timothy was influenced by mom and grandma. Timothy's faith was not supported by his dad. We know that because the Bible tells us. Over in Acts chapter 16 and verse 1, Paul tells us about Timothy's dad. Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Then came he to Derby, this is Paul, then came he to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, the son of a certain woman which was a Jewish and believed. But his father was a Greek, which was well reported of by the brethren that were at Lystra and Iconium. By the way, the church hadn't changed much. News still travels fast. Verse 3, him would Paul have go forth with him and took and circumcised him because of the Jews which were in those quarters, for they knew all that his father was a Greek. The distinction is made here that mom was a believer, but dad was a Greek. We don't have time to deep dive into it this morning, but I can just tell you this. To be known as a Greek in this culture meant that you were not a believer. You are not a believer. The Bible makes a clear distinction here. This mixed marriage of believer and unbeliever didn't make a desirable situation for Timothy. That, this wasn't the ideal environment for someone to be assured of, of their faith, but Timothy's mom made sure it happened. Timothy's grandma made sure it happened. Not only did Timothy's mom and grandmother make a huge impact on him when it came to him being assured of his faith, but the apostle Paul himself had much to do with Timothy's assuredness in the faith, and I think this switches our focus from the family 
to the church. Lighthouse, who are you assuring that this is real? If you are below the age of 18 in this room, I'm not going to make you say anything. I just need you for an illustration for a minute, okay? So if you are below the age of 18 in this room, would you please stand? Go ahead. Hmm. Hmm. I believe the apostle is showing us the great responsibility that the church has. Go ahead and look around, by the way. Look around. I believe the Apostle Paul is showing us the great responsibility that the church has in discipleship. Discipleship is so much more than a class. When, when these young people watch you, church family, are they being assured of their faith? When they see how you react to situations, are they being assured of their faith? Are they assured by seeing you step out by faith and trust God for big things? Thank you, young people. You can be seated. On December 7th, 1941, the Japanese Air Force launched a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and forced the United States into World War II. The Japanese carriers launched 360 planes against the American Pacific Fleet First bombs fell at 7.55 in the morning. 18 U.S. ships were sunk or severely damaged. Some 170 planes were destroyed. And American forces suffered about 3,700 casualties. President Roosevelt described it as a day which will live in infamy. What some people don't know or don't realize is that on December 8th, 1941, the Japanese attacked British Malaya. The Prime Minister of Britain at that time, Sir Winston Churchill, now had a decision to make. Was he going to declare war on the Japanese that he really didn't have a good chance of winning? Was he going to take his men in to this kind of a battle? Then the news of Pearl Harbor reached Winston Churchill. Though deeply sympathetic with American losses, he understood that the Japanese just made a fatal mistake. He knew that the Japanese underestimated American resolve. And he knew that America was going to do something about it. He knew that the United States would now be forced to have a full-scale involvement in the war. And upon hearing the news, Churchill reportedly turned to his advisors and said, now we will win. Now we will win. Throughout the course of human events, we find history-changing moments like Pearl Harbor. Decisions which move things in different directions. Such is the case when the Apostle Paul walked into Lystra and Derby and saw a young man named Timothy and took Timothy under his wing and mentored him and made sure that Timothy was assured of his faith. God's plan to take the gospel west into Europe rather than north into Asia changed the face of global evangelism and the march of the church for hundreds of years. Timothy would become a major player on the missionary team of Paul. He participated in six of Paul's epistles in 2 Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, and Philemon. He received two letters from Paul himself. Paul calls him a son, a fellow worker. 
And he includes Timothy whenever possible in his itinerant ministry before ultimately placing him in leadership at Ephesus in First and Second Timothy. Church, it's time that we understand that we could literally be changing the course of history if we understand that these young people need to be assured of their faith. And that responsibility, part of that responsibility, falls on us. We can change history, or we can just let them think church is something you play around with. It's not something you're a part of. It's just something you go to. Make sure the young people that you have influence over are assured of their faith. Live it out in front of them. Make God a big deal in your sphere of influence. The Holy Spirit must be allowed to work in individual hearts. I understand that. But part of the reason Timothy continue, was continuing here was because he had been made assured of his faith from the people who had influence over him. How big is your God in front of your kids? The last thing I want to give you, and it's just one verse, his leaders need to continue the example of teaching. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. How are we doing, church? How you doing, dad? How you doing, mom? Are we making sure that these young people are assured? Are you assured of your faith?